Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm just in the Clark. How are you? <laughs> nice to meet you, Kristen, virtually. <laughs> We're really happy to have you here. We just would love you to say your name and tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your personal history. I'm Kristen Neville Taylor. I'm a, an artist, a mother, an educator, and a, a curator. I've lived in and around Philadelphia all of my life, um, which is often reflected in my artwork. I grew up just outside the city in the suburbs uh, with my mom, who was a kindergarten teacher, and my dad, who was a glazer, and my three brothers. My artwork is um, influenced by the stories that I learned growing up about nature, but also the um, ideas that society, that influence society's ideas about the natural world. Uh, could you tell us what your typ typical studio practice looks like? So actually, um, like, well, my work change, it changes according to the projects that I'm involved in or what's going on in my personal life um, or what's happening in the world. So uh, actually for one of my most recent works uh, that I called, they told us Earth was mother, but it is in fact the sun. Um, I was actually researching the history of solar power um, and its narrative and technical possibilities for a project I was working on with Ricky Giannis. I was pregnant with my first child when I started it, uh, but I didn't finish the sculpture until after I'd given birth. And so as a new mother, I experienced that newborns respond to cyclical time rather than our well-established linear time. And this is a phenomenon that midwives uh, refer to as horticultural time. And uh, I became curious about the role of time in human lives and the way it challenges environmental progress. So I created this clock in clear glass um, to imagine what would, what would it mean to apply horticultural time to human lives outside of just infancy. And so it's for me meant to imagine a more sustainable world using something that's inherently human, but also at the same time radical, like a radical mode of time. No, oh, that's one of the pieces we were specifically very interested in. It's, it's so beautiful. So thank you for talking about that one. I also would like to ask you about Notices and Wonders, if you could explain a little bit about that piece. Notices and Wonders is actually like an elementary school exercise where students are asked to say what they see uh, rather than to like maybe apply what they they think they know about something. And so I was looking at a painting of the landing of Columbus by John Vanderlyn, uh, just trying to see, state what I saw rather than to um, infer what I might uh, think I know about the painting. And so that was one of the, the way that the text came about. So it started as a list and then it evolved into a kind of poem. The, the piece is really for me about uh, trying to understand why we privilege um, materials in the painting. Um, a lot of the, the, these like explorers that are coming to the first time to the Americas have all of these things that are material, like uh, flags and hats and symbols. And so um, there's an anthropologist that I really like that talks about how we often privilege these objects rather than the absences. So the all of this, the balls on the platform on the ground are what I think of as like future artifacts that have all been pulverized and shaped into balls to kind of eliminate their ability to be categorized in familiar ways. So that's just some of the story behind that one. Could you also tell us about your piece, Who Owns the Moon? Who Owns the Moon? is a piece that I did in the Pine Barrens. The first time I went to the Pine Barrens, I got a tour from um, uh, someone who was really familiar, like a naturalist that lives nearby. And I remembered him telling me that after the iron and glass industries, industries had um, deforested the area, that it looked like the, the moon because there was no trees. It was just these lumps and stumps. And um, I loved thinking, well, I, I hated that history, but I loved thinking of that as an image. And so I wanted to connect land claims that were historically made in the Pine Barrens, uh, like making it into um, a jet port or people wanted to take all of the water out of the natural aquifer and like ship it to the Philadelphia. Um, there was all these, there's been all these um, proposals over time. Um, and I wanted to connect that to land claims made to the moon. And so that's where that comes from. And thinking, because I feel like it's so romantic to think about like living on the moon, but it also has some of the same violence or like, you know, 
maybe not such a good intention, even though um, it's kind of romantic. The next question we'd like to ask you actually is like, how have you stayed creative during quarantine or during this time in general? I think I've been channeling my creativity mostly into motherhood, but I've also been, um, you know, thinking worrying and dreaming a lot about other things that connect to my artwork. And honestly, I haven't been interested you know, in making in ways that were previously standard for me. Uh, even prior to quarantine, I was really questioning my material-based practice and trying to zoom out from what I've always done. So I've been able to use this space and time to like think about maybe some new methods. Um, I've been looking at a lot of architectural models and been thinking about proposals and schematics as um, finished works. That's kind of where I'm at. Like I realized that some of these models and solutions that I was coming up with before the pandemic that could make my work small and less material reliant could also be really great ways to dream up new worlds. Definitely. Um, is there an artist that you are inspired by or excited about right now? Yes, I actually have been really excited about artist homes and gardens. And um, there's the um, some members of the collaborative Wretched Flowers who recently bought a property in Connecticut and they've been turning it into a perennial flower farm and I got really excited about the images that were recently circulating of Derek Jarman's home and garden prospect cottage so those are things that have been getting me excited lately it's fantastic speaking of projects uh, what is your dream project if you could work on anything at all um, actually that's I think it connects to those artists projects or homes is that um, I've been dreaming for a long time about buying land outside the city where I can live, build a studio, grow food and like combine, you know, build a practice that can combine all of my interests where everything can merge. And so that feels more urgent now. And I, I dream of hosting a residency or some kind of alternative school there, but honestly, I'm mostly interested in the benefits and learning outcomes that I can't anticipate. In what ways do you think that art and artists will be beneficial during this time? I think that artists are not strangers to manifesting resilience in times of relative normalcy. And so I think we have the potential to imagine what tools and strategies we might call on moving forward. I mean, as you are very familiar, I'm sure are so many facets of our industry are being impacted as a contingent faculty member and other people who are employees for or arts organizations. Everyone's looking at the bottom line. And But I think that um, Philadelphia artists in particular have like a lot of organizing experience, working in collective and community-based models, the ability to take the long view, whereas I get nervous that some of our leaders, university administrators, Mayor Kinney, are proving that they might not be able to do that. Definitely. What kind of literature would you recommend to artists read right now or just people in general during this time and staying aware and also present in those things? Um, I think this is a difficult question because it has been a little bit challenging to focus on longer texts, but um, I would recommend Anna Singh's Mushroom at the End of the World because she talks a lot about uh, collaborative survival, but it's through the lens of Matsutake mushrooms. So it has like a lightness and it offers some hope and like solutions. So it's kind of like some relief from the challenging news cycles, but at the same time dealing with those challenges. And are there any words of advice that you'd like to offer any artists or words of advice you've been given that you would like to share with everybody? I think that the advice I'm giving to myself um, um, so I don't know if I've taken it, but is to resist privileging endless productivity now and into the post-COVID future. I was saying a lot to my students, be patient and kind to yourself and others. Definitely. Absolutely. This is a time of patience, like above, <laughs> above all else, for sure. In an ideal scenario where, where money is no object, what uh, art piece by any artist would you love to live with? This was the hardest question, um, I think. Um, I kept writing things and I couldn't, I couldn't come up with this answer, um, but I just kind of settled like on a Marissa Murs Fountain as my last choice. We, we really love your work and thank you so much for taking this time to just hang out with us and answer some questions. We're so happy that we could be a part of this project through Philadelphia Sculptors and support artists. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care, Kristen. Bye -bye. Thank you.